In this video, we're going to learn about snap latches and ribs and plastic parts. Hey everyone, this is Matt with Learn Everything About Design, and in this video, I wanted to carry on with our new plastic part design series, and I want to talk a little bit about snap latches and ribs that are on plastic parts. Now, this is not going to be an all-encompassing video. I just want to cover some very basic topics so we have an understanding of some of the design decisions that are going to affect us downstream. To get started, I want to turn on my component color cycling so we can see the different colors of each component. And of course, you can go into the description of the video and you can download this data set. The first thing that I want to do is I'm going to hide the pin component and I want to focus just on the base, the side pole, and the core. The core that we have here represents our plastic part. Now, of course, it's a section view. We're just looking through the side of a plastic part but we have a base of a thickness 0.1 inches. Then we have a vertical rib that's tapered in at two degrees, and then we have a snap latch. Now the snap latch is positioned in the middle of the part. This is typically not something that you would do. Oftentimes it's going to be closer to the edge, but the design challenges still remain. So the main thing that I wanna talk about here is going to be rib thickness, which we're gonna to get to in the next component example, and I want to talk about snap latches and why these are different and what they mean to us when we're designing. The first thing to consider when we're talking about snap latches is it produces an interesting situation where we have to be extra careful with draft angles, their direction, and also the thickness of our part. So one way that we can look at this is that we have our core that needs to pull away and we can't have it mechanically locked or stuck to our plastic part. And this is of course why we have draft on our parts because as they begin to cool and as they begin to shrink, we want them to automatically eject themselves and not lock into the mold. So when we have something like a snap latch, well, it produces an interesting challenge because we now have an underhang that we have to deal with. There are a couple different types of snap latches, and this is going to be the most common one that I think we're going to run into, so it's the one that I want to focus on. When you're designing a snap latch, probably the best scenario is for us to have a consistent wall thickness on the snap latch itself, which means that both walls are parallel and both walls are tapered in the same direction. Now, this is good from a plastic part design standpoint, but it's bad from a manufacturer standpoint. Especially when you're talking about low production, this makes it increasingly challenging for us to create a part that can be produced in low production molds. So the reason that this is challenging is because oftentimes low production molds will have restrictions or requirements like side poles, like this green body here, have to be at 90 degrees to the part which means that it can only pull out sideways relative to the overall shape of the part. It also sometimes means that we can't have any complex shapes on the end of those different side poles. Now again, that becomes problematic because then we run into situations where we have to design our plastic parts around those requirements. The side pole is one way that we can get around this. And when we're talking about higher production molds, then the side poles or the cores that we can use to get this geometry are a little bit more involved. One other way that we can get around this is to use what's called a pin. Now, pins oftentimes will be in the same pole direction as the rest of the mold. Now, in this case, what we would have is a small hole in the bottom of our plastic part where we could insert a pin. And the pin would have the appropriate draft on it and would allow for the rest of this mold to continue to come down and create just a small opening wherever we needed a snap latch. Now, this helps us when we're going for low production, but it also means that we need to have a hole or an opening on the bottom of our part. Sometimes that's just not an option. So these are the things that we need to think about when we're designing parts that have to snap fit together. Oftentimes, we also need to consider things like, is this a permanent assembly? Is this a one-time snap fit? Or do we need to provide access so that we can stick a tool in and release the snap to open up whatever assembly we're designing? 
When we get into actually designing our plastic parts, we'll talk more about these design decisions, but I thought it was important that we at least have a basic understanding of some of the things that we need to think about when we're designing our part, and especially when we're designing the assembly method, whether we're talking about bosses for screws or if we're talking about side poles for snap latches. The next thing that I do want to talk about is going to be rib thickness, because this not only applies to snap latches, but also ribs or webs that we put internal to our parts, and even bosses for screws. When we look at this, we need to make a, a sort of a distinction about one of the basic criteria that we're aiming for with plastic parts, and that's a consistent wall thickness. If we have areas that are too thin or too thick, it causes problems in various aspects of the process. If we have areas that are too thin, especially if they thin out and they get thick again, it causes problems with actually getting plastic material to them during the injection molding process. If we have areas that are too thick, then it causes cosmetic problems because the outside area of the plastic is going to cool before the inside area. And when that cools and shrinks, it means that we're going to have a deformation on the outside of our part. If you take a look at plastic parts that you may have around your house, oftentimes, ones that are going to be less expensive, or potentially ones that have larger shapes to them. If you look at a plastic housing that's for something like an electric lawnmower versus one that's for your computer mouse or some small desktop appliance, then you'll oftentimes see that the larger pieces, you'll be able to see the areas where internal structural ribs are or potentially areas where there was too much plastic and there are sink marks. This is because on larger parts, it's harder for us to fill the entire mold with a single injection site or even multiple injection sites. There need to be vents and different runners and sprues in order to get the plastic where it needs to be. But that's getting a bit outside of the point of this video and the point of this series. And that's to just understand the basic design rules. So what we have here is a base that is 0.1 inches thick. And I use that value just because it's easier for us to work with that value when we talk about things like 60% of that, which would be 0.06. So then I have a couple of ribs that are designed based on 60%, 75, 90, and 100% of this thickness value. When we use internal ribs, generally we shoot for somewhere between 60 and 75% of the wall thickness. It is important to note that none of these have draft on them. If they have draft, they will be getting thinner at the top and we want to plan for the thickness at the bottom relative to the height of the rib and the thickness of our overall plastic part. So at 60%, you can see that I have a circle here that touches each point at the bottom of our rib and is tangent with the bottom of our housing. You can see that the thickness here is just above the thickness of our housing. And this is important because that means that as this cross section here cools, a small amount of material is left directly in the center of here cooling. So if we can get away with less than 60% and still get the performance that we need out of it, then we should consider using a thinner rib wherever possible. As we go up to 75%, which is generally considered the upper range of the, the rib thickness that we would want to use, you can see now we're at 0.114 inches. So we've gone up a good bit just by going to 75%. If we take a look at 90%, we're now at 0.12, 100% is 0.125 or an eighth of an inch. So this means that as the rest of this part cools, that 0.1 inch, then we have 0 0.025 in the center of this that's still molten plastic and still has to cool and solidify. So this is the reason why we want to avoid using internal ribs at the thickness of the rest of our housing because we need to make sure that we minimize the area in which we're gonna have these sink marks. When we have parts like cosmetic appliances, things where you have an A surface that's gonna be consumer visible, you wanna be especially careful not to break these rules because then you will have blemishes and deformities on the outside of your product. And that's obviously going to be a bad thing because it reduces the attraction or the appearance of the outside of the product. So these rules were meant to be broken in certain instances, but we need to be careful and make sure that they're on the B side or the hidden side and not on the outside face of our parts. So again, this is just a basic, basic, basic introduction. This is not an all-encompassing guide on designing each of these features. 
If that's something that is interesting, I can talk more about the nuances between the different types of snap latches, but there is a lot of great information out there. If you're designing a plastic part and you need to figure out the ideal shape for things like a living hinge or the ideal shape for something like a snap latch, then there are all kinds of plastic part design guidelines that you can easily find just with a web search. And oftentimes it is important to note that if your goal is to do a short run production, things like using a um, one to 500 part production run, and you're using a non-liquid cooled aluminum mold, then you're gonna have different requirements that you have to meet versus a full production run, many thousands if not hundreds of thousands of parts that run through these molds then you have a little bit more flexibility for your design guidelines. But it's always important that you understand those and you talk to a manufacturer that's going to be running your parts to make sure you know what their design restrictions are. That process tends to be a back and forth discussion. You'll send a part, they'll review it, they'll tell you areas that you need to change or adjust. You'll ask them if they can make it do with, with the design as is. And that back and forth happens until both parties are happy with the end result. Now, if you've worked with a specific manufacturer for a long time, oftentimes you know those design rules going in. But in some cases, if this is your first part or your first run of parts, then that back and forth is gonna happen. Some manufacturers like Proto Labs will have an online guide where you can upload a part and they'll have a diagnostic tool come back and it'll say areas where we need to add material for things like ejector pins, or we need to add more draft, or we need to change the shape of something. So this can be very handy, especially getting started if you just wanna see if your design can be manufactured. At this stage, I think the next part of this process will be to get into using our design tools, things like form bodies and surfacing tools. But if there are any other topics or discussions that you want expand it on if you want more information on then please let me know and i'll do my best to cover those but i think that we have the basics down understanding draft and understanding some of the design decisions that we have to make getting into our plastic parts so once again if there are any questions please leave a comment or send me an email and as always thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one